All right, well, let's kick this thing off. We've got um, an awesome critical mass here. Um, so welcome to our first ever virtual Fall Fest. We are so glad to have you all join us on um, this Friday evening. Um, my name's Phoebe. I'll be helping um, move the sort of agenda and um, order of events along this evening. Um, but we'll be hearing from a number of folks um, on the steering committee as well as from the huts department and then we are very excited um, at eight to be hearing from our featured speaker eric copel who's going to be talking a little bit about white mountain art and his amazing career um, so just a few items um, before we get started here this meeting is being recorded so um, keep your you know your future political careers in mind um, and just know that it is going to be recorded and um, made public at some point for those who couldn't um, join us this evening to enjoy. Um, everybody is going to be muted except for the speakers just to avoid, um, you know, other people and phones and whatever going off um, in the background. Um, so unmute yourself if you do need to speak. Um, but generally, if you do have a question or comment, the best way to contribute that is going to be using the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, so if you haven't found that yet, hover your mouse over to the very bottom of your screen. You'll see a couple options, in including security, participants, share screen, click on chat, and that is going to be the way to uh, share questions and comments um, with our speakers. Um, let's see. Lastly, I also wanted to point out in the bottom of the screen, there's a reactions button. Um, so everybody take a moment, go down and see if you can find the reactions button with a smiley face. And you can do clapping hands or you can do a thumbs up. And that is a great way to let our speakers know that you like what they have to say. Um, all right, so I think that's about it. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna hand it over to Stroger to give a little introduction for our evening. Welcome all to uh, Fall Fest. Tonight we'll be doing an abbreviated version of the usual. Uh, on the plus side, I hope this new format allows some of you to join us who might not otherwise be making it. Um, as many of you know, I'm Stroker, chair of this illustrious organization. Uh, at this point, we're going to skip the traditional introductions just to help move things along and keep Phoebe happy since she's really the one who's running the show. Um, we also usually recognize some special people at this event for their service to the huts and to the mountains. But we're going to set that aside as well until we can do this in person. Uh, I'm speaking about the uh, honorary OH awards, uh, special member and honorary member. Um, no doubt there are a lot of things we'd all rather be doing in person. So apologize, apologies in advance for having to do this via Zoom. Um, not doing this in person is kind of like not hiking the summit in with an 80 percent chance of thumpers so uh you know better safe than sorry i hope you all understand that i'm sure we all would rather be together in one room but that's just not going to happen this year um before i think turn things over to phoebe i'd just like to say um that uh, i really appreciate her and carter our treasurer handling the technical the technical aspects of this meeting um better <laughs> better than than me. Um, and on that note, I'm going to turn things over to Phoebe. Thank you, Stroker. Um, so I just wanted to share with you all um, this evening, although we could not be together in person for a larger um, group reunion in Crawford Notch, we do have a number of mini reunions planned for outdoor um, or indoor very carefully socially distance events around the country. If you could go to the next slide, Carter. Um, so just for an overview of um, when and where we have events going on, um, we have events in Seattle, uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, Missoula, and Bozeman, um, as well as an online event via Zoom that Peter Ward has organized for Lakes Cruise of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So um, if you do live in any of these places and didn't get a chance yet to RSVP, now would be a good time just to um, write down the person's name and email to get in touch. Um, I will also post a link in the chat with um, the link to the page on the OH website that has more details on these events and the same information to RSVP. So we're really excited that all of these are happening and 
hopefully it actually sets a good precedent for um, regional meetups like this moving forward. Really fun to connect with um, other OH in your area. Thanks, and I'm gonna hand it over to James for our toast to absent friends. Um, if you don't have your beverage ready, um, you know, pick up whatever's closest to you and that will do the trick. Thank you, Phoebe. Uh, this year we lost some, some dear friends to us uh, in, in the Hutz community. Bob, Bob Stillings, Lori Jane Dombeck, Edward Blatchford, Dick Hale, Paul Anthony DeBello, Dave Eastman, John Burnham Howe, and Mike Micucci. If you have others that you would like to add, uh, please feel free to do so either in the chat or by unmuting yourself right now. I'd also like to take a moment uh, within this uh, to recognize the loss that all of us have felt in one way or another during the pandemic. Um, it has touched all of us in one way or another and um, many in terms of uh, loss of, of life and dear dear friends. So um, to, to have some friends, although out of sight, we can recognize you with our glasses. Here, here. Thank you, James. Um, next up, we have Emily Griffin with our HUTS update. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see you all via Zoom tonight. And I echo everyone's thoughts so far. While I wish we were all together this evening, it does, of course, make sense to meet virtually. So thank you all for being here. I'm here to provide a pretty brief update on how the huts were running this past summer season. As most of you know, it was a pretty uh, different looking season for us in the huts. This summer looked different in some ways, but also in other ways looked pretty similar. Um, we did close all eight huts to overnight guests for the first time in a long time. That being said, we were quite lucky to staff them with some incredible caretakers and keep them open as a public resource. Uh, we're gonna go through some photos on this slide here uh, and just kind of take a look at what the summer looked like in all of its weird ways. The uh, caretakers served as stewards in the backcountry, seen here on the floating dock at Lonesome Lake. Um, but in all seriousness, they provided crucial trail and safety advice to countless day hikers seeking solace and enjoyment outside. This summer seemed as though we saw record numbers of folks recreating on the National Forest, um, looking to get outside and stretch their legs after months of staying indoors and quarantining. Um, so a lot of these caretakers provided exceptional trail advice and information, um, providing weather and other resources to ensure that folks were hiking safely. And most of them, while had experience before, these, a lot of these hikers were hiking in the whites for the first time, if not just hiking for the first time ever. So the caretakers were really, really incredible and did some awesome work um, outside of making incredible crosswords to share on truck trip on Thursdays, um, but also in the sense of providing wonderful stewardship in the backcountry. Um, while the season looked different, there were a lot of magic brought into the hills. There's a lot of scrubbing, mask wearing. I believe on these slides we'll see Jeeves wearing a mask. Uh, so everyone was quite safe out there. Co-caretakers had a routine of scrubbing the hut uh, every two hours and again providing all of the kind of comforts and solace in the backcountry to day hikers all around. Moving into the winter, the huts are all now shuttered. Um, we are looking forward to next year. We're hopeful for some sense of normal with cakers flipping and doors open to all. Um, but overall, the season went as well as it could, and we're really happy to say that there was still some magic brought to the hills that we all love. And there are a few more photos left. There were some weddings, which was quite exciting at Lonesome. And this is Lonesome and Zealand boarded up for the first time in a really long time for the winter. So moving ahead, we look forward to these huts being filled with the guests that we know and love, uh, filled with 
some BFDs, hopefully from a safe and appropriate distance uh, and doors open to all who want to spend time in these hills. I'm also here to provide an update on the diversity, equity, and inclusion work that the AMC is doing on the whole as an organization. Um, this past year, the AMC made a public commitment to work towards working towards a more diverse and inclusive in organization for all um, back in the spring. Some of those efforts in, are involving a lot of staff members right now, both full-time and seasonal. There was a survey that was sent out to gauge uh, organizational health and understand how staff perceive the organization right now. The AMC has also taken measures such as working with the Alpine Five to rename some climbing routes across the United States um, that are either racist, misogynist, or overall problematic. The organization has also been hosting virtual events with intention to lift marginalized voices in the outdoor community and it has also hired a diversity consultant to help with this very important work. Um, another big initiative for the AMC on the whole has been board engagement with DEI efforts. Working closely with the boards at large on DEI is a major focus for the AMC right now and then also moving into the year 2021. In terms of DEI work in the huts world, we continue to work on making the huts more accessible and a welcoming space for all. Um, a big personal focus of mine this winter will be focusing on diversity efforts in hiring um, and hiring practices moving forward as a community within the AMC. So overall, uh, an exciting and weird year for us in the HUTS department. I am now going to turn it over to EB, who will provide a much more accurate real HUTS update. Hello, everyone. I think um, Carter will be showing a little video slideshow I made of some more photos from this season because I know that's what everyone really just wants to look at. And uh, behind that, yeah, Carter, you can go ahead. I'll, I'll give him a little speech. I'll start when it goes. Okay. By the end of the summer, the phrase in a normal year had become as routine as directions to the bathroom. We conjured images of a bustling dining room and naturalist talks by the lakes to explain why we were there to passerbys. Folks would also explain that they had had reservations for this year and I would commiserate by saying I'd have loved to bake them fresh bread. The truly bittersweet moments though were meeting two wonderful women who would have been first years on my crew. It gave me a sense of deja vu, of remembering something that had never happened, but that my five prior seasons allowed me to visualize in such detail it felt real. Of course, this year wasn't a normal year, but what do hot kids do best? We adapt. How many of you have had to remake a dish at the last moment or thaw a frozen pipe with hot towels? It's a basic element of the job. And so we adapted on a massive scale. The huts were open to day traffic. We had water spigots installed outside and cleaned the bathrooms a lot. We sold burritos and baked goods and OTC snacks. And when we ran out of things, we sold tuna sandwiches and chocolate mousse and pretzels and peanut butter squares. Instead of hanging out at the OH cabin together, we started a caretaker group chat that regularly received videos of Eric and Kyler over at Galehead doing scooter tricks. It wasn't a normal year, but each morning as I tied the blue apron around my waist or looked up at Mount Washington, I felt the same sense of gratitude that's universal among hut kids. I felt grateful to work in the mountains for one more summer. Despite the massive switch in routine, there were still beautiful and exciting moments. The three of us at Lakes would eat dinner together in the quiet dining room, playing cards and watching the sunset. We were also at the hut when Hurricane Isaiah came through and watched screens fly out of windows, signs fly off the walls of the hut, and water seep in through, through the kitchen. Um, the peak gust recorded by the observatory that day was 147 miles per hour. We all killed way too many mice for comfort this summer and slowly gave into the reality that the chipmunks were just taking over and moving in. We still packed in all kinds of weather, though the wrecks were a little lighter and still had immensely busy sunny Saturdays. Without getting too sentimental, I'll note that this was likely my last season in the huts and not exactly how I envisioned it. But one thing that even a global pandemic can't break is the strength of the hut community. Those of us who were COVID caretakers now have more stories to pass on and those stories find us closer together. And now to end on a lighter note. <laughs> Pop. Oh. Shred Let's go!
No! We got a lot of these in our group chat this summer and it certainly made it fun to watch. Thank you. Thank you so much, E.B. Um, next, we are handing it over to Alex to um, conduct the business meeting and give us the treasures update. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I know that Zoom is not the ideal place for doing this, so I just want to thank everyone for uh, being flexible during all this. Um, so. I'd be remiss if I didn't tell everyone that some money came in and some money came out and we still have money left over. Um, this has been true for many years. It hasn't changed this year. Um, but with that being said, uh, there are some important numbers I do want to talk about. So um, first and foremost, income and expenses. Uh, our total income this year was 17734 that's within normal uh, from, from past years, so that's great. Uh, our total operating expense so far has been 8,500. Um, this includes the projected cost of mailing out the dues notices for the 2021 season, which is always a heavy line item. Um, and historic expenses have been about twice as much as what this is. Uh, and this reason is because uh, there hasn't been a lot of maintenance done to the cabin yet. Uh, Mike will continue to be vocal about maintenance needs uh, and the club will continue to budget uh, and plan accordingly, but that's the way things sit right now. Uh, I also know that a lot of people are probably asking what's been the impact of COVID-19 on the OH treasury. Um, so I can happily say that there's been no serious financial damage done regarding lost income this year. Uh, as you know, or maybe you don't, uh, the cabin's been closed to visitors most of the year. Uh, our two forms of income that the club receives from cabin use are annual cabin passes and fees associated with cabin use. So historically, we can depend on about $3,000 a year for this type of income. Uh, and this year we earned uh, about 1,160. So that means we lost about 1,860 in projected income by closing the cabin. Um, however, historically, we can also expect to spend about $1,000 on social events. And by that, I mean spring reunion, winter reunion, Oktoberfest, and the end of summer party. We didn't have any of those this year, so we were able to save all those expenses. So at the end of it all, we lost about $800 because of COVID. And in the grand scheme of things, that's a nominal amount when you look at the total cash flow of the club. So we're fine. Uh, changes uh, and updates to the OHA finances. Uh, in an effort to reduce friction associated with paying dues and donations by mailing a check uh, or having to figure out how to use PayPal, um, Schroeder and Brian Post and I have been putting our heads together uh, and we've made a lot of updates. Let's be honest, Brian's been making all the updates. Schroeder and I are just giving input. Uh, so one of those things that we've changed on the website is we're now securely accepting credit card transactions through the website. Um, so right off of the website, you can now securely pay for your due or your donation or buy merchandise. Uh, and it's the same way that you would purchase anything online. Uh, so, in fact, you could go to ohcrew.com or Google OHA AMC and you can get to the website and you can pay your 2021 due right now as we speak. Uh, in other news, we're waiting for our federal 501c3 paperwork to be processed by the IRS. Uh, once that goes through, we'll be able to accept donations with the added incentive of a tax deduction and this will help sweeten the prospect of larger capital donations to the club. It's a long time coming uh, and that's in the works right now. And then lastly, we have a new category of membership to choose from. Starting this year, we're offering a lifetime membership opportunity for $600 and this will guarantee your OH membership as being in good standing for life. 
uh, wrapping things up, some treasury goals I have for 2021. Um, I have two main ones that I want to work on this year. Uh, the first is to continue to use CDs as a short-term investment vehicle. And that's between six to 18 months uh, that those mature. And it's depending on the interest rates that they, that they earn. Um, and then the second goal is a little bit bigger, but it relates at this intersection between money and information that the treasury sits at. So the activity that, tre that the treasury sees, uh, it sees more uh, of, of an information hub to the club because every incoming dollar and name associated with those dollars comes through the treasury. There's a large opportunity to use it for outreach efforts. Um, so in short, we can start to see who's paid a due or donated in the past and then offer reminders if they haven't paid a due this year. Um, so my idea is to better democratize this information to the club committee uh, or committees so it can be used to help with existing club efforts relating to finances and club membership. It's important, and I want to emphasize this, uh, that it isn't going to be the result, this isn't going to result in a constant badgering of emails to pay your dues or donate money if you haven't, but rather it's to look at past members who have paid and check in with them and also reminding them that their membership benefits are, are, are due uh, if they would like to, to contribute. Um, and in particular, we're hoping to use this method to reach young OH, um, who make up a pretty small population of the club currently. Uh, and the hope there is that this effort will dovetail nicely with that new friction-free method of paying online. And the end result will be more dues, more donations, and then a growing club roster of active members. Um, that's it. That's all I got. Thanks everyone for your time and your attention. Um, I believe it's my, my authority next is to um, present the uh, committee members for next year for vote. Um, you'll have to forgive me. It's my first year doing this. Moose is the tried and true expert. Um, but for the 2021 season, we have myself uh, as treasurer, uh, Carter Boscom as secretary, Moose Reserve as Treasurer Emeritus, um, Emma E.B. Brandt and Miles Howard will be the co-editors of The Resuscitator. Uh, Kim Schroeder Stewart will be a web mistress. And for members at large, we have Phoebe Howe, Vice Chair, Emily Griffin, Emily Benson, Elizabeth Seabury, Jeff Colt, and Gary Whitting. Uh, anyone who doesn't see reason to see this committee take place, speak now, chat now, react now, uh, or forever hold your peace. Uh, with all that being said, I'll pass this back over to Phoebe, uh, and thanks again. Great, thank you so much, Alex. Um, we all appreciate your work with the Treasury and um, steering the ship. Um, and we have some kudos for you in the chat. So I'm not the only one that feels that way. I appreciate um, that. I do just want to offer a plug for lifetime dues. That is a 24-year payback period. So that's a pretty good deal. Um, so yeah. Um, let's see. Okay, so next up, um, we um, are going to take a, a short pause here um, while Eric Kopel joins us um, and gets his presentation up and running. He is local to the White Mountains. He lives in Jackson um, with his partner, Dominique Dodge, who's an OH. And he is here with us tonight to talk about White Mountain art in general, as well as, as, well as share details on his career. Um, so Eric, if you are with us, um, please go ahead and um, unmute yourself and um, get your PowerPoint up and running. And then actually the last thing I'll say, Eric, before we hand it off to you is um, Eric is going to take questions along the way. So if you do want to ask him questions, and please do, um, just put those in the chat and he'll keep an eye on it and I'll keep an eye on it as well to make sure that we get to your questions. All right, so take it away, Eric. Hi, everybody. So just trying to get it so I can see the chat at the same time as the thing. There we go. Um, so I'm an artist. Um, 
I've probably met some of you guys um, working here in Jackson, New Hampshire, and um, some things that I've started to become known for are um, one, reviving 19th century um, methods of landscape painting. Like there was a lot of uh, landscape painting in the United States in the 19th century that was in a very realistic style that uh, celebrated the beauty of the natural scenery here. And so I've been trying to revive those methods. And um, more particularly, I've been trying to revive that movement right here in the White Mountains. Um, and so um, here, this first slide is um, a painting of Mount Washington um, that was sketched. Uh, I made this painting and it was sketched um, from uh, up on the tin mine in Jackson. I just opened up and I changed the land a little bit. Um, but this painting is in the Jackson Historical Society. Um, and that's um, just for those of you who don't know, a great place to look at White Mountain art if this subject is of interest to you. Um, and so something else, if anybody has any questions about anything, you can feel free to ask as we go along. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's that painting. Now let me see, this isn't moving right. Okay, this is a painting that um, is of the Hudson Valley, something that, um, so American landscape painting originated in the Hudson Valley. Um, I had this big uh, six foot painting, which I did for Maris College, um, and that's that. Um, so this painting, um, you guys probably know some of the mythology behind. So this, this is um, a painting that I did for the Jackson Historical Society that's um, of the Willie side uh, in Crawford Notch, um, which uh, was a big event that brought tourism to the White Mountains um, long ago. Um, and so it was an interesting project for me because I was combining um, like actual scenery that's there. Like um, we have the, um, the cliffs on the back of Mount Willard and Mount Willie to the side and then where the Saco goes down through. But um, it said that during that event, the Saco went up um, about 20 feet and uh, the Willies um, were lost in that deluge. And so I did this wild painting of the water flow going down Mount Willie and I kind of put, if, if you look at the bottom center, there's some cows and stuff washing in and there's the little figures at the bottom right um, fleeing, which they, they obviously uh, perished in the slide. Um, but that sort of connects back to um, something about what this kind of landscape painting is about, is um, that uh, there's this wildness <clears throat> to these mountains that can sometimes make them dangerous. And um, that feeling of um, sort of fear of nature being more powerful than you are is, is part of why we love this type of landscape um, so much. So um, that's that one. Um, and this is a big painting um, that I did for the Jackson Historical Society. Again, um, this one is actually really large. It's like 11 and a half feet by six and a half feet. And um, it depicts Mount Adams uh, from the base of the auto road. And this site is open. So if, if you're interested, you can go in there. It's usually pretty quiet. You can wear a mask and um, you can see the painting in person. So I just put this slide in for the scale of the project because it's, it's something that uh, people might enjoy seeing. And then, um, what I was depicting here was um, I was imagining the time when that area up by the auto road was first cleared um, and how excited it must have been because as we all know, this area um, without the influence of humans cutting trees um, is just so filled in that it would be really hard to see anything um, from except from like ledges and on the top of the mountain. Um, and so I was imagining like, well, like what it must have been like when people first started cutting trees and opening up these big views and, and how exciting that must have been. So there's something coming in 
do you have a piece of your artwork in salt in Gorham? Um, I don't think that I do, but I can't guarantee that nobody bought a painting and put it up in salt. <laughs> so, um, but I'm, I'm not aware of one that's there. Um, so, yeah, so I, um, I cleared open the view for that to see, and then I'm sort of, um, let me go on to the next one. There's a really cool unveiling of this. In the photos, it looks like it was only 10 people there, but it, actually the whole room was filled with people. Um, and they actually caught this. Uh, we did the veil drop thing, which was really fun. Um, and that was October of last year. Yeah, so before, um, before the whole mask thing. Um, and there's some details. One of, the, one of the things that I really liked um, when I was bringing this painting together was the little, little figure that's looking out into the scene in the lower left panel there. Uh, uh, one of the last things I did for the picture was to raise his arm up um, to, in a sort of, like there's a little other figure out there that he could be waving to, but I also sort of think of it as, as a salute um, to the beauty of the landscape. And I saw it, sort of thought it made a nice positive message um, in, the painting. So anyway, that's there. If anybody wants to go see it, that's in uh, 23 Black Mountain Road in Jackson at the Historical Society, the old town hall. Um, and so interestingly enough, I like when I do a lecture to just talk about where the kind of painting that I do comes from. And so this is um, a piece of ancient artwork from Pompeii, and it's one of like the earliest landscape paintings. So um, I just put that in there. I think it's really interesting that like there's this sort of um, ancient way of drawing, but they still had all these things, the figures in proportion to the land and like the beautiful color harmonies of nature and sort of exciting story within the painting, not just showing you exactly what's there. And that that into the renaissance of paintings like this. Um, I put this one in because um, it's it's one of the early landscape paintings of the Renaissance but also because it's, it's one of the first paintings that really personifies the landscape with human, human sentiments, which is really part of um, the poetry of that art form. So like the storm and the lightning is kind of symbolic of something that's going on there in this relationship <laughs> with this angry woman <laughs> situation. Anyway, this is also one of the first <laughs> beautiful, uh, um, this is, a Karachi painting and this is a form of landscape painting that developed long before American painting but what is considered sort of a classical style of landscape painting so we have an Italianate place we have a sort of religious Catholic storyline and then architecture and it's really all about the sort of pastoral relationship with human beings and the land and the it doesn't it may not look revolutionary to us here in this time but in that time landscape or um, paintings in general were all about big figures doing things and the figures filled the whole picture but in this painting um the story is told by the landscape not um not just by the figures so it was kind of a revolutionary thing that developed into this where we can see like claude lorraine we're talking about like 16th century now um and, and suddenly you have beautiful atmosphere and light and things are starting to get very naturalistic and even more about landscape and even less about the sort of little figure story going on and that's because claude was sorry for the bad slide there but um claude lorraine was going out and actually drawing from nature a lot very specifically there was a similar dutch school that was doing the same thing we're getting the 17th century john constable in england drawing very very closely and accurately from nature studying moving things before photography and like really looking at clouds and how they work and making paintings like this that have these beautiful, incredibly gorgeous rendered moving skies that um, the atmosphere in the picture and the, the story of, of um, light and color in the air is really just telling the story of the painting and the idea that the landscape sort of reflects um, the, the poetic feelings that humans have towards nature, not just a sort of optical or photographic 
depiction of nature. Um, so there's that. Um, and then this is like really kind of over the top Turner painting of a Greek myth. Um, well, this is from the Odyssey. Everybody knows that story. So this is the Cyclops up there. He's been blinded and then the, the ships are going away. We all read that one, I bet. Um, yeah, so any questions? Because I am used to having an audience that I kind of feed off of when I do lectures. <laughs> and I can't see you guys' faces, so I don't know if this feels boring or not. Um, so somebody said, process like, um, how do you pick a location, begin to paint, get proportions right, etc. Okay, so I um, don't tend to use any photography for the making of my paintings. So I, um, I go outside and I hike and I walk and I explore rivers and I always bring my sketchbook with me. And um, so I find beautiful places and I do drawings of them for the most part. And then also I paint outside, um, or bring a paint box out and do paintings maybe up to about 24 inches uh, outdoors. And the, the outdoor work is kind of like gathering inspiration for the larger studio paintings. So like going back to the big painting, oh wait, where's that? I'm going the wrong direction, that's why. Um, so well, actually I can talk about this from this painting. So here, here's a big six foot painting. And um, here, here's the, the sort of process of how this works. So this, this is the waterfall painted by me. This is the same waterfall painted by Thomas Cole uh, below. Fr uh, from below, uh, he had more of a trickle. So I was painting right up there. And I basically sat on the edge of that cliff for about a month. And in that month, I did tons and tons of different drawings of all kinds of little things that you can see in the painting. Do you use the same paint as used by the original artists? Um, so yeah, I, it, the pigments are basically the same. You know, there's, there's some differences between the paints that were used long ago, but it's, it's basically the same uh, processes. Um, but get, getting back to the sort of intellectual aspect of the prospect or, or of, of the project, like if you look at this um, drawing in the upper left of this screen and then I go back to the painting that it used it, you can see that that was very closely realized in the top of that waterfall. And when I was painting there and then all these different parts I was drawing and figuring out the mechanics of water and studying leaves and the little plants and all the various things about the spot, not just what one view looked like, but like really trying to get to know um, what this thing was like. And so these were all outdoor painted studies that were done for the same painting. Um, and you can see in the, the bottom right one, that's maybe where I developed a lot of the idea for the final composition. And then I did this sketch, which was a 24 by 36, um, to get an idea of how I wanted to lay out the, the six foot version. I decided not to do it in the large one in this sort of rosy light, but did daytime light. And I changed the composition a little bit to come up with this, which was the final product. So that's, that's kind of how um, my process basically works with, with nature. And so just in general with oil painting, um, it's, it's a layered process where you start out, um, you, you know, you start out, very thinly and then you let it dry and you build up layers and layers and layers of paint. Um, and so somebody says, how did you get into this type of painting? And that's Phoebe. Can you tell us more about your artistic background? Um, so I um, was drawing and painting even when I was a kid. And then like, like very, very young, like three, four, five, I was always drawing and painting and then um, when I was in high school, um, like uh, up until high school, I was kind of doing like comic book type stuff. I was really into comic books. And then um, around when I was in high school, they started restoring the Sistine Chapel and there was this big National Geographic article on it. And um, I saw those images and that really got me to be very interested in fine art. Um, and I thought like, oh wow, like there's this type of drawing which I'm familiar with from the comic book stuff I do, but like the level of content and poetry in these paintings is so much higher and more beautiful. 
um, that's something I wanted to pursue. And then I started really getting into oil painting in high school. So I decided to go to art school and I went to RISD and I studied um, painting and illustration at RISD. And then I, went, I moved to New York City after college and went to uh, the New York Academy of Art for um, grad school. And then I got into this interesting project where, um, so after I finished the master's program for grad school, um, I did a series of murals where I was copying Raphael paintings um, in New York for a church in Ireland. And there were these huge like eight by nine foot paintings um, of multi-figure thing, like very typically what you would think of for Raphael. And then that was a huge learning experience just in terms of very traditional methods of working to be able to copy those. And then um, when I was in my late 20s, I started getting really, really into landscape. And that would now be, you know, 12, 15 years ago. Um, I'm 40 now. So yeah, can't remember. <laughs> but um, but but yeah, so then I did. So I was I was really interested in European landscape painting, like some of that stuff I showed earlier in the slides, where um, I was doing these kind of invented landscapes. And then when I went on this trip to do this painting, which we have here, um, which was a month long residency in the Catskill Mountains in upstate New York, that's actually when I really got into um, American landscape painting, because I could see these spots where the 19th century artists had painted and like, when I was making my paintings, I could think about the kind of poetics and things that they were doing to the landscape that made them so beautiful and interesting. Um, and so um, from there, I kind of slowly shifted more and more into um, painting the American landscape. And that's what I did. Here's Monhegan Island. Um, and I've been all over the place. This I think was done in Mexico. A lot of these are outdoor paintings. Um, and that's Monhegan again. This was done actually up on Whitney Hill in Jackson um, a couple of years ago. There was just really interesting light on the clouds. And I, I um, tried to do a really quick capture of um, those kind of storm clouds we get here. Um, I like that one. That's Fort Ticonderoga uh, down below. So um, that would be a picture of Lake Champlain, I think. And I've been out to the Rockies. This was Dream Lake and Yosemite, Gettysburg, Rockies again. And oh, and here's another White Mountain painting. This is actually one of the earlier paintings of uh, Mount Adams that I did from Lowe's Bald Spot um, around here. So, yeah, I, I think, um, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> well, that's my last slide, folks. <laughs> How long do these take? So, um, the, the painting process, um, I, I, like when I do a commission painting, I usually allow between three months and 18 months, depending on the size of the project. So, um, um, yeah, it, it, the painting has to dry several times though. So it's like, I work on many, many paintings at once and then they all kind of come together eventually. So have you ever put a hut in a painting? I have not put a hut in a painting yet, but that is a good idea. Okay, so do you think your paintings have an environmental message at all since you're painting an earlier or less damaged landscape? Um, so, yes, I, I think actually that representing the landscape has an inherent environmental message. And so, interestingly enough, um, the Hudson River School artists in the 19th century, and that includes the artists who painted in the White Mountains in the 19th century, um, were part of the early conservation movement at the end of the 19th century. So a big thing that happened was um, a lot of artists were going up to paint Niagara Falls and then like Niagara Falls just became like 
Coney Island all of a sudden, like all these sort of entrepreneurs came in and there were, you, you know, rides and all this stuff um, up up in, in Niagara Falls and the artists were kind of like, well, this is ruined. And, you know, they were restoring it to an original, more original way when they were painting it and like trying to capture a beauty that was kind of no longer there. But when people saw what happened to Niagara Falls is why they, when they went out west, they were trying to preserve um, places like Yosemite and other things with the early national park movement. So I saw something here about, um, Bierstadt in the Whites and elsewhere now. So I wanted to show actually, um, oh shit, shoot. Um, I hit the wrong button, hold on. Um, now my mouse disappeared, this is bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, hold on, hold on, okay. We're, we're back, let me screen share that thing again. Um, I just wanna show you um, somewhere in here, do you see that now? Um, so yeah, Eric, we see Mount Washington among the clouds right now. Okay, okay, good. So I'm just getting to the side so I can click through and show you the Bierstadt painting um, that I put in here. So, so I'm actually gonna show you some historic paintings of the White Mountains. So this is a Bierstadt of um, Emerald Pool. Do you see that? Yeah, we see Emerald Pool, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay, good, good. So so that's a Bierstadt painting of Emerald Pool. He also did one of the moats and ledges. Now this is a Bierstadt of uh, Mount Lafayette um, from I think around Sugar Hill, no, maybe low, like Frank, what's, I don't remember what town, but you can see Lafayette, you can see Eagle Cliff right there. This would of course be Cannon Mountain and um, that, so that's a Bierstadt. And then here's a Sanford Gifford painting of, of Mount Jacorowa. You can see that he dramatically exaggerated the peak, but like you get the idea that that's the view from Route 16 over Jacorowa Lake. Um, and, and then um, this is actually a very precise rendering um, of uh, Franconia Notch by Asher B. Duran from West Campton. This is like a six foot painting that's in um, the New York Historical Society, which is a very, very good museum. And it is, um, so there's Lafayette, there's Franconia Notch and Cannon Mountain and all that good stuff from uh, the PEMI in, uh, from about Campton, New Hampshire. And uh, so this is basically just, yes, the 19th century artists were up in this area and they were, um, capturing these beautiful places that we know. And this is perhaps the most famous historic White Mountain painting. Uh, this is Thomas Cole. And uh, every, every one of you who have been to the Highland Center knows this view quite well. He kind of made the Saco Lake a lot smaller. There were some, uh, this is before the, the Crawford House existed, but there were some of those little boarding houses down there. And you can see Elephant's Head and um, uh, Mount Webster and the notch, Crawford Notch. Um, so there's some historic paintings of the White Mountains. Now I have to try to see the meeting again. <laughs> um, let's see, more. Eric, I can read you some of the questions if you want. Oh, oh here we go, oh, I okay. found them. How many OH are already collecting your work? That's from Stroker. Um, so I don't know how many OH are already collecting my work. I know at least um, a couple. But th the thing is, too, that when you're not OH, you don't know everybody who's OH. I don't know, like, who's in the cult. I should probably, like, click the, click the little thing to know. So anyway. So a couple, you recall a Bierstadt, what type of people are your collectors? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I have all kinds of different people who are my collectors. Um, my paintings are fairly expensive. So um, a lot of the people that are collecting my paintings are, are fairly well off, but some some of them aren't, and just decide that 
they would like to spend a lot of money on a painting. Um, but th they come in all shapes and sizes. And I have collectors of all different ages, young and old. And um, I, I like to think that the people that buy my paintings um, tend to like a painting that that has a certain feeling to it, like that it that it's not just what things look like, but like how how it feels to be in beautiful places, like as a as a person. Um, so um any next mega paintings on the horizons do you think you'll ever beat the size record on the jackson one well i haven't um yet in my life um, been able to predict the future so i don't know if i'll be able to make a painting bigger than that or not um what but I would definitely happily do so if somebody wanted to commission one. I basically paint up to six feet um, just for my for my own easel painting, and then I would only do something larger than six feet if uh, somebody commissioned it from me. Um, so there was an artist who did all the huts watercolors in the mid '80s. Postcards were made of them. Interesting. Um, view from Echo Lake in Franconia. So that's referring to that Bierstadt painting. Um, and Andy McLean is a collector. That is true. Um, so, uh, okay. So there's an event. Okay. Well, that's pretty much all I got, folks. If there's no more questions, um, I really appreciate your listening to all this and um, keep in touch. I'm on uh, Facebook and Instagram. If you like to follow traditional paintings of the White Mountains, I have got lots. All right, thank you. <laughs> all right, thank you so much, Eric, for joining us this evening. Um, that was awesome. Um, as I was saying to you the other day, it's been I don't know, probably about a year since any of us have been in an art museum at this point. So it's um, fantastic to get to have the art museum come to us. Um, all right, so um, I'll just take a second. If anybody does have any last minute questions for Eric, um, feel free to um, leave those in the chat or um, we'll also share Eric's website um, if anybody wants to um, share that in the chat. Um, that is a great way to see Eric's work and um, get in touch with him as well. If anybody wants to be the next OH collector. Um, so to wrap things up this evening, um, just wanna say thank you for joining us. Um, this is our first sort of virtual OH event. And so it's been a great um, trial run for hopefully more to come um, as we continue to weather the pandemic here. Um, just for closing remarks, um, we just remind you that the OH cabin is closed until further notice um, for the pandemic. So thank you for respecting that and following along with those guidelines to keep us all safe as well as our friends in the uh, White Mountain community. Um, we do have two events on the calendar for 2021. Um, of course, they may or may not happen um, in person depending on what is up with COVID at that point. Um, but for your calendars, we do have a spring reunion um, planned at the OH cabin for May 15th, as well as next year's Fall Fest for November 6th. So again, May 15th and November 6th um, for your calendars, subject to change depending on what happens with COVID. Um, the OH steering committee is always open and uh, welcomes your suggestions, constructive criticism. Uh, just the other day, we had a young OH write in suggesting that we host a virtual trivia night at some point. We love getting suggestions like that. Um, we love it even more when you also offer to help um, organize and host. So we welcome your input and your participation in uh, the OH community. Um, and creative ideas like that. What can we be doing during COVID to bring folks together, where, whether it's you know really regional, kind of small scale in-person meetups or virtual events. Um, we'd love your ideas on how to bring folks together. 
I know Peter Ward has gotten, I think, 40 attendees, again, 40, 40 attendees for his um, Lakes 50s, 60s, 70s meetup on Zoom, which is super cool. So as far as you have more suggestions um, like that, um, we would love to hear them. Um, our next steering committee meeting is on December 15th on Zoom. Um, we would welcome anybody who'd like to listen in, find out what the steering committee is up to and offer any input. Um, and we do keep steering committee um, agendas and notices as well as minutes after the meeting on Facebook as well as on our website. Um, so without further ado, I think that is the end of our um, meeting this evening. Um, we will um, leave the meeting open for a little bit if anybody wants to um, ask any questions, throw anything in the chat, um, but you're also welcome if you'd like to use this time to um, share anything with the group, um, you're welcome to go ahead and do that. So thank you all for joining and um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Phoebe. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Phoebe, and everybody who made this possible. It was very good. Great to see you. Yeah, this is a great Zoom meeting. Thank you. Mm -hmm.